last Sunday was the greatest Sunday of the year as we reflected on this great news that Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Risen indeed, yes. We still get to celebrate that. While the rest of the world has moved on, there are already, I think, what's the next one? Mother's Day? Is that the next? While they've already got the Mother's Day candy out and the Mother's Day card, we, the church, stay here celebrating this amazing news that our God is not dead, that he is risen, that our Savior reigns at God's right hand. We continue to celebrate. Like the early church, though, it often takes, or it, it does actually, not often, it always takes the resurrection to fully appreciate what Jesus has done on the cross. We need to revisit the cross in light of the resurrection. Here's the part. There is a heresy running rampant in the global church today. The heresy is this. Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins so we can go to heaven. Now, I'm actually being a little bit cheeky here. But technically, this is actually heretical, and let me explain why. It gets it mostly right, but not completely right. And most heresies aren't popular because they're wildly wrong, but rather because they're almost true, but a little bit off. Let me be clear. Let me first clarify this. First, I do believe Jesus died and rose again on the cross. Or sorry, died and rose again. I do believe Jesus died on the cross. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross and saved us from our sin. Those two are true. But he also accomplished a whole lot more on the cross. He accomplished victory over Satan, victory over death. He revealed God's love to us. He showed us what God looks like. He became king, just to name a few things that Jesus accomplished on the cross. But Jesus didn't do all of this just so we could go to heaven. It's not just about that. Jesus' goal was not to just give us a way to get to heaven. His goal was to obey his Father. His goal was to save the world, to reconcile us and the whole world, all of creation, back to himself to become king. And as we'll discuss today, to reconcile us to our Father in heaven, God. Now, out of all of that, there is a side benefit that we get to be with God in eternity. You guessed it, heaven. So we still get that. It's not that we don't. It's just not the point or the main thing that Jesus was trying to do is just to get people to heaven. He actually wants a whole lot more for us. Well, I realize I'm being a little bit cheeky, oops, cheeky this morning. I want us to see that Jesus accomplished so much on the cross, so many things that there are books written about him, and you start reading them all together. You start seeing all these things pile up, accumulate, meaning around the cross. Let's do this. Let's pray, and then we'll get into this scripture this morning. If you would pray with me. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your word, that not only did you reveal yourself through your son, but you continue to reveal yourself through your spirit. Holy Spirit, we pray for you to be here with us and help us to understand your word, and you reveal yourself through the scriptures, Lord God, through the Bible. Help us to read it well and understand in new ways, in faithful ways, who you are, Lord God. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Take a look at this picture. What do you see? What is this? Go ahead. Say it out loud. What do you see? A blue thing. What else? Hexagon. That's triangles, right? Multiple shades of blue. What else? Anything else? An umbrella. Okay, interesting. Perspective, umbrella. A what? A prism. Right. All of these things. I was thinking more simplistically. Not surprising. What's that? A laundry basket. <laughs> Weird. This is like that picture. This is like that picture. Well, you know what? I see a Hemi engine. How's that? I see, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Your brain. Okay. <laughs> Me, I have, man, I'm sorry. I'm like way too basic. I was just thinking this is a segmented blue hexagon. <laughs> so boring, right? Pretty basic. But look at this picture. Here's the point. What if I do this?
we realize that there's more to the image than what we realize. We were missing the whole bottom half of it. And actually, Doug, you were even talking about perspective as seeing it from the top like an umbrella. But we still haven't even seen the whole thing yet. What if we do this as well? The thing is, we have to keep moving our perspective around the cross to see the whole thing. I think it's part of just human nature for, to desire to want to connect with people, especially people who don't know Jesus yet. And you want to connect and say things that will matter to them. And for people who maybe don't know Jesus, one of the best things that you can talk about, the most appealing things to them might be the idea of heaven, like a paradise when you die. And so I think the preaching around that, because people want to get to the good stuff, to help people come to faith, that people can get the idea that the cross was all about dealing with our sins so we could just get to heaven. If you notice in that statement, there is no mention of God or Jesus or the Spirit. And so we as Christians want to keep expanding, keep moving around the cross so we get a full perspective of it. In this same way, Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sin. That is true. That is wonderfully true. That is life-changingly true. But there are other important things that we have to say, that we must say about the cross and what Jesus accomplished there. The truth is, Jesus accomplished quite a bit on the cross. First, he did save us from our sin. He did defeat the evil, or defeat the devil, defeated all evil. He defeated death. He became king. And the one, I mean, then there's, there's others as well. I just don't have room to list them all. Uh, he also wanted to reconcile us to God our Father. And the thing is, these two here are actually related. See, why did Jesus die on the cross for our sin? Part of it goes back to God because God doesn't endure sin. God can't endure sin. God won't endure sin. And it's not because God is just mean and grumpy. It's actually because God is holy. And we have a hard time explaining, at least I have a hard time explaining that in our common words, that God is holy, completely, entirely good and just. And so when you are completely, entirely good and just and God, you can't just say, well, you know, sin's not that big a deal. You know, I just, we'll just kind of sweep it under the rug or we'll just kind of move on and act like it didn't happen. I mean, if you did something minor, you you might think like, I don't know, if you were speeding, for example, or well, that's not a good example. If you told a little white lie to someone, and you think, well, come on, God, like, you're going to like, get upset about a teeny tiny little white lie? But, say, if someone lies and thousands of people lose their lives, then you're like, yes, we want that lie punished or to be reconciled. We want something done about that. So the thing is, God is completely holy, completely pure. Not only that, but God is just. And so he won't just let sin slide. Now, when it's a teeny tiny little thing, we think like, oh, come on, God, that's not a big deal. The, the, it didn't really hurt anybody. Can't we just move on? Versus someone, say, like Stalin, who killed millions of people, then we're like, yeah, punish that sin or those sins. The thing is, all sin necessarily separates us from God because God is holy. Sin separates us. It has to. If it didn't, we would die. And God is opposed to sin. God hates it when we do sinful things, especially when those sinful things hurt other people. I have this conversation, and those of you who have kids or are related to kids, you, you probably have this conversation where you're saying, like, stop doing this to your brother or your sister because I love your brother and sister, and when you hurt them, it makes me upset. I think God is similar with us, that he loves his children. And so when one dictator kills thousands of people, he's angry at that because it's hurting his thousands of children. All sin, even little sin, even tiny little things, put up barriers between us and God. I think sometimes we talk so much about salvation from sin that we can almost lose sight of the relational element. We can just, I mean, sometimes people talk about it, and even there's songs that sing about it, like I've been set free from sin. And there's truth to that. Jesus did more than justify us despite our sin. 
Sometimes we can think about it as just about our sin and us. You know, like, I've been set free from my sin. It no longer, I'm no longer ashamed of it. It doesn't haunt me at night. It doesn't revisit me at 3 o'clock in the morning when I worry about it again. We can just think about sin in just a personal way. But when Jesus died on the cross, we were set free from sin. We were set free from things like addiction. That's all true. We've been set free from the shame of sin. And we've been set free from a life dictated by sin, where sometimes there are people, and maybe some of you know people like this, most of us do, who just say, you know what, I'm just bad. They might not say it quite like that, but they live their lives believing that they are just bad. They don't deserve anything good, and so I might as well be as bad as I can. There are people who live with that sort of thought in their mind, that sort of thought process. But we have been set free from sin, that's true. And all this is good, but it can be reduced to a transaction where God did this for us so that I can get that. God did this for me so I can get heaven. God did this for me so my sin won't bother me anymore. But it, in both of those, sin doesn't bother me anymore or I get heaven, those really aren't about God yet. They aren't about a relationship with him. And Jesus, Jesus intended so much more for us. Listen to that again. Jesus intends so much more for us. Listen to this passage from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, still separated from God, a barrier is between us and God, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified, been made right by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him, through Jesus? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only, not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So not only have we been reconciled, but now we celebrate, we boast about, we praise God who has given us this reconciliation. As humans... We have a prevalent and ongoing problem with sin. But God is merciful, and he wants to save us. And because God loves us, Jesus came and died for us. He died in our place. He died to pay the penalty of sin, to rescue us from the consequences of sin. He came to address God's anger at sin, to remove the barrier between us and our Father in heaven. That's why in the New Testament, after when Jesus died on the cross, it talks about the temple curtain being torn in two. That was the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. Separated the place that the priest could move in versus the place of God. That curtain was torn in two from top to bottom, from God's end down. God is removing the barrier that sin has put between us. He is wanting us to be reconciled to him, for our relationship to be made right with him. Jesus' death on the cross removed this barrier between us and God. On the cross, Jesus reconciled us to God, our Father in heaven. That's why it's called the atonement. We say atonement in English from so many, probably a couple hundred years of using the word, but actually it's two words together, at one meant to be made at one, to be reconciled. That's what God has done on the cross. Jesus has reconciled us to God. Which is why it's important for us when Jesus speaks to Mary, we talked about this last week, and I don't know if, this was, if you guys were catching this, but at the outside of his tomb on Easter morning, Jesus says this. He says to Mary, he said a few things to her, but like for, for example, don't be afraid, but, or why are you crying? But he also says this. He says, go to my brothers and to my sisters and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Now, there's places in the Hebrew scriptures where people understand themselves as children of God. They also understood God. I mean, any Jewish person would think of God as being their God. But when Jesus says this on Easter morning, I think he's meaning something particular, something different. In a new way, we have been reconciled to our Father in heaven. Jesus died on the cross to accomplish many things. And one of the most important is to reconcile us to God, our Father. 
So much of our faith flows out of that reality. Before, if, if it was just to help us get used to or, or get over our sin, or if it was just to, to get us into heaven, like, that's okay, and there's good parts of that. There's really no relationship in that. Jesus died to get us those things as well, but also so that we could be in a right, so that we could be at one, so that we could be reconciled to our Father in heaven in a relationship with him. Our sin has been forgiven. Our relationship with God the Father has been restored. This is the good and a new, sorry, this is the good and amazing news this morning. Not only do we have salvation from sin and everything that means for us, not only can we put it behind us and finally move forward, not only does it no longer define who we are, now we have been reconciled because of it. The gap between us and God is gone. The barriers between us have been removed. It's like the story of the prodigal son, the son who, who says basically, Dad, I, you're not dying fast enough for me. Can I have my inheritance now? Goes off to a distant land, lives a crazy and licentious life, runs out of everything, is eating food that he serves to pigs, which for a Jewish person is especially uh, embarrassing and dishonorable and shameful. And so he says, I can at least go back to my father who owns an estate and I can serve as one of his slaves, one of his servants. And yet, the father is watching. He says, because when the father had seen him from a long way off, and then the son came, he comes and he embraces the son. And the son tries to spit out his words about how he'll be a servant. He can't even get them out. And the father puts a ring on his finger and a robe around him and says, let's, fatten, let's, let's, let's have the, the calf that we've been raising, especially for a feast. Let's eat it today because my son has returned. This is the sort of love that God has for us. This is what he desires, this sort of reconciliation. Not just to help you, I mean, to help you work on your sin and to help you move through that, but also, and more importantly, to make a relationship with you. That God is a relational God. He desires for you, for all of us, to be in a relationship with him. So now we have been reconciled. Now we too can turn to our Father in heaven not as slaves or as hired workers, but as beloved children. This means that when you pray, you don't need to come as a servant, as a servant would to their master, but as a child speaking to your good and loving father. For some of you, it may sound like a tiny change, like a tiny thing, like an, a new aspect that we're adding to this idea of the cross. But once you make it, it's like a key that opens a lock, that opens a new door into a completely whole new way of living. I want us to do one thing this week. I want us to walk through this door to not only receive the grace that we've been given, but to step into relationship with God, our Father, our good Father. Spend time with this God who loves you. Many of us do that through prayer. Many of us do that through walking in this creation, this amazing place that he has created. But realize or walk, spend time with him. Now, I want to say this, too, because some of you might be frustrated with God. And so me saying this might actually be frustrating to hear. But I encourage you, even if you are frustrated with him, he loves you deeply. He loves you deeply. Go and spend that time with him, whether it's on a walk, whether it's in your prayer chair, whether it's at home with coffee and your scriptures. Spend time with God being reconciled to him. This morning, I hope you hear good news. I hope you hear good news that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sin, yes, and to defeat Satan and death and become king, yes, and, but also to re reconcile us to our Father in heaven, to restore our relationship with him. I hope you hear good news that you don't need to relate to God as a hired worker, but as his beloved child. Go this week in this amazing news that Jesus died on a cross to save us from our sin and many other things, but also, and maybe in some ways, mainly to reconcile us to our Father in heaven. You are a people reconciled to God. This is the good news. Amen. And so now we get to share in the Lord's Supper. This meal, in many ways, 
is meant to remind us of the sacrifice that Jesus made. And I hope that you're hearing it this morning, maybe seeing it in light of the fact that Jesus is risen, that this meal reminds us that God did all of this to reconcile us to himself. This meal, many things are happening here. Over the centuries, we as a church have realized that there are numerous things, numerous aspects of this, like another jewel that spins, numerous aspects that happen around this meal. It reminds us of Jesus' sacrifice. It reminds us of our sin, that we don't deserve this grace that we've received. It reminds us that this meal holds us together as a church, as the family of God. But I also hope it reminds us that Jesus, that our Father in heaven, that the Spirit who dwells in us, God desires a relationship with us. Today, much like the ancient world, meals are meant to bring people together. Meals are meant to bring families together, to bring friends into a relationship. This meal is meant to do the same. It's meant to remind us of Jesus' sacrifice, but to remind us that he did this so that we could be restored in a reconciled relationship with our Father in heaven. So as we come to share this meal together, reflect on that, that Jesus died to restore your relationship with God, our Father in heaven, to restore your relationship with him. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. And after he'd given thanks, he said, this cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Church family, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. If you would, please stand. Jim, do we have the, the um, Apostles' Creed? Please stand as we profess what we believe along with the church, the global church, our brothers and sisters, whether they're in Cameroon, whether they're in, in Brazil, whether they're in China or Russia or Canada, as well as our brothers and sisters throughout time. Over 2,000 years, the church has been celebrating this meal, remembering that God has reconciled us, desires a relationship with us. So let's proclaim this together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. One more, Corbin. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Mary Beth and Hunter, would you come forward, please? And Shalem. This morning, we'll be receiving the Lord's Supper by coming up through the center. And so as you're ready, come and receive. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord 
of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. Jesus Christ, given for you. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given for you. The body of our Lord <laughs> Jesus Christ, given for you. Thank you. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you. Because this bread comes from one loaf, when we share it, we remember that we belong together. It's not the cup we share, participation in the blood of Christ. I pray that it reminds us of his sacrifice today. Let's thank God together for this meal. Lord God, we praise you. We praise you for this meal and everything that it means for us. Lord God, so many things that you accomplished on the cross, that you defeated sin, Satan, and death, that you became king, but also, Lord God, that you have reconciled us to yourself. We praise you for this good news, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.